Keeping Tryst, A Tale of King Arthur's Time, by Annie Fellows Johnston. Now there was a troubadour in the kingdom of Arthur, who, strolling through the land with only his minstrelsy to win him away, found in every baron's hall and cotter's hut a ready welcome. And while the boar's head spotted on the spit or ale sparkled in the shining tankards, he told such tales of joust and journey and feats of brave knight-errantry that even the scullions left their kitchen tasks and, creeping near, stood round the door with mouths agape to listen. There was his hop-strings, tuned to echoes of the wind on the winter moors. He sang of death and valour on the field, of love and fealty in the hall, till those who listened forgot all save his singing, and the noble knights whereof he sang. One winter night, as thus he carolled in a great earl's hall, a little page crept nearer to his bench beside the fire, and, with his blue eyes fixed in wonderment upon the grey beard's face, stood spellbound. Now Edorin was the page's name, an orphan lad whose lineage no man knew but that he came of gentle blood all eyes could see, although, as a vassal, t'was his lot to wait upon the great earl's squire. It was the yule-tide, and a wassail ball was passed round till boisterous mirth drowned oft times the minstrel's song, but Edorin missed no word. Scarce knowing what he did, he crept so close he found himself with upturned face against the old man's knee. How now, thou flaxen-haired, the minstrel said with a kindly smile, dost thou like my song? O oh, sire, the youth made answer, methinks on such a wing the soul could well take flight to paradise. But tell me, prithee, is it possible for such as I to gain the title of a knight? How doth one win such honours and acclaim, and reach the high estate that thou dost laud? The minstrel gazed a little space into the yule log's flame, and stroked his long hoar beard, then made he answer, Some win their spurs and earn royal accolade, because the blood of dragons stains their hands. From mighty combat with these terrors they come victorious to their king's reward, and some there be sore scarred with conquest of the giants that ever prey upon the borders of our fair domain. Some who have gone on far crusades to alien lands, and there, with heart of gold and iron hand, have proved their fealty to the crown. Then Edrin sighed, for well he knew his stripling form could never wage fierce combat with a dragon. His hands could never meet the brawny grip of giants. Is there no other way? he faltered. I wot not, was the answer, but take an old man's counsel. Forget thy dreams of glory, and be content to serve thy squire. For what hast such as thou to do with great ambitions? They'd prove but flames to burn away thy daily peace. With that, he turned to quaff the proffered bowl, and add his voice to those whose mirth already shook the rafters. Nor had he any further speech with Edorin, but afterward the pretty lad was often in his thoughts, and in his wanderings about the land he mused upon the question he had asked. Another twelve-month sped its way, and once again the yule log burned within the hall, and once again the troubadour knocked at the gate, all in the night and falling snow. And as before, with merry jests, they let him in and made him welcome. And as before, was every mouth agape from squires to scullions as he sang. Once more he sang of knights and ladies fair, of love and death and valour, and Edorin, the page, crept nearer to him till the harp-strings ceased to thrill. With his head upon his hands he sat and sighed. Not even when the wassail ball was passed with mirth and laughter did he look up. And when the grey-beard minstrel saw his grief, he thought upon this question of the yule-tide gone. Ah, now, thou flaxen-haired, he whispered in his ear, I bear thee tidings which should make thee sing for joy. There is a way for even such as thou to win the honours thou dost covet. I heard it in the royal court when I last sang there at the king's behest. Then, all aquiver with his eagerness, did Edorin kneel with face alight beside the minstrel's knee to hear. Know this, began the greybeard, 
"'Tis the king's desire to establish round him at his court "'a chosen circle whose fidelity hath stood the utmost test. "'Not deeds of prowess are required of these true fellows. "'With no great conquests does he tax them. "'But they must prove themselves trustworthy, "'until on hand and heart it may be grave and large, "'in all things faithful. "'To Merlin the Enchanter he hath left the choice, who by some strange spell I wot not of, will send an eerie call through the kingdom, and only those will hear who wake at dawn to listen in high places, and only those will heed who keep the compass needles of their souls true to the north star of a great ambition. The time of testing will be long, the summons many. To duty and to sorrow, to disappointment and defeat, thou mayest be called. No matter what the tryst, there is but one reply if thou wouldst win thy knighthood. Give heed, and I will teach thee now that answer. Then, smiting on his harp, the minstrel sang, so softly under cover of the noise that only Edrin heard. Through all the song ran ever this refrain. It seemed a brooklet winding in and out through some fair meadow. Tis the king's call, O list, thou heart and hand of mine keep tryst. Keep tryst, or die. Then Edrin, with his hand upon his heart, made solemn oath. Awake at dawn, and listening in high places, will I await that call. With the compass needle of my soul, true to the north star of a great ambition, will I follow where it leads. And though through fire and flood it take me, I'll make but this reply. Tis the king's call, O list. Thou heart and hand of mine, keep tryst. Keep tryst, or die. Pressing the old man's hand in gratitude, he could say no word for the strange fullness in his throat that well nigh choked him. He rose from his knees and left the hall to muse on what had passed. That night he climbed into the tower, and with his face turned to the east, kept vigil all alone. Below the rioters waxed louder in their mirth. The knife was in the meat, the drink was in the horn, but he would not join their revels, lest morning find him sunk in sodden sleep, heavy with feasting and witless from wine. As grey dawn trailed across the hills, he started to his feet, for far away sounded the call for which he had been waiting. It was like a faint blowing of an elfin horn, but the words came clearly. Edrin! Edrin! One awaits thee at nightfall in the shade of the yew tree by the abbey tower. Keep tryst. Now the abbey tower was the space of forty furlongs from the domain of the earl, and full well Edwin knew that only by special favor of his squire could he gain leave of absence for this jaunt. So, from sunrise until dusk, he worked with will to gain the wished-for leave. Never before did buckles shine as did the buckles of the squire entrusted to his polishing. Never did menial tasks cease sooner to be drudgery because of the good will with which he worked. And when the day was done, so well had every duty been performed. Right willingly the squire did grant him grace, and forthwith Edirin sped upon his mission. The way was long, and when he reached the abbey tree, he fell a-trembling. For there was a tall wraith stood within the shadows of the yew. No face it had that he could see, its hands no substance. But he met it bravely, saying, I am Edrin, come to keep the king's tryst. And then the spectre's voice replied, Well hast thou kept it, for tis known to me the many menial tasks Thou didst perform, ere thou could come upon thy quest. In token that we two have met, here is my pledge that thou mayest keep to show the king. He felt a light touch on the bosom of his inner vestment, and suddenly he stood alone beside the gruesome abbey. Clammy with fear, he knew not why, he drew his mantle round him and sped home as one speeds in a fearsome dream. And that it was a dream he half believed when later, in the hall, 
He served at meat those gathered round the old earl's board. But when he sought his bed and threw aside his outer garment, there on his coarse rough shirt of hodden grey a pearl gleamed, white above his heart, where the wraith's cold hand had touched him. It was the token to the king that he had answered faithfully his call. Again before the dawn he climbed into the tower, and, listening when the voices of the world were still, heard clear and sweet like a far-blown elfin horn another summons. Edrin, Edrin, one awaits thee at the midnight hour beside the black Kilgore's water. Keep tryst. Again to gain his squire's permission he toiled with double care. This time his task was counting all the spears and halberds, the battle-axes and the coats of mail that filled the earl's great armament, and o'er and o'er he counted, keeping careful tally with a bit of keel upon the iron-banded door, till the red lines that he marked there made his eyes ache and his head swim. At last the task was finished, and so well the squire praised him, and for his faithfulness again was fain to speed him on his way. It was a woeful journey to the waters of Kilgore. Sleep weighed on Edrin's eyelids, and haltingly he went the weary miles, footsore and worn. But midnight found him on the spot where one awaited him, another wraith-like envoy of the king, and it too left a touch upon his heart in token that he had kept the tryst. And when he looked, another pearl glimmered there beside the first. So many a day went by, and Edorin failed not in his homely tasks, but carried to his common round of duties all his might, as if they were great feats of prowess. Thus gained he liberty to keep the tryst with every messenger the king did send. Once he fared forth along a dangerous road that led he knew not where, and— when he found it crossed a loathly swamp, all filled with slime and creeping things, fain would he have fled. But pushing on for the sake of his brave oath, although with fainting heart, he reached his goal at last. This time the token made him wonder much, for when he wakened from his swoon, a shining star lay on his heart above the pearls. Now it fell out the squire, to whom Edorin was page, was killed in conflict with a robber band, and Edorin, for his faithfulness, was taken by the earl to fill that squire's place. Soon after that they left the hall and journeyed on a visit to a distant lord. T'was to the castle of content they came, where was a joyous garden, and now no menial tasks employed the new squire's time. Here he was free to wander all the day through vistas of the joyous garden, or loiter by the fountain in the courtyard and watch the maidens at their tasks, having fair speech with them among the flowers. And one there was among them, so lily-like in face, so gentle-voiced and fair, that Edorin well nigh forgot his oath, and felt full glad when, for a space, the king's call ceased to sound. And gladder was he still when, later on, the earl's long visit done, he left young Edorin behind to serve the great lord of the castle, for so the two friends had agreed, since Edorin had pleased the old lord's fancy. Yet was he faithful to his vow, and failed not every dawn to mount to some high place, when all the voices of the world were still, and listen for the sound of Merlin's horn. One morn it came. Edorin, Edorin, one waits thee far away by the black cave of Atropos. When the moon falls, keep thy tryst. Now t'was a seven days' journey to that cave, and Edorin, thinking of the lily maid, was loath to leave the garden. He lingered by the fountain until nightfall, saying to himself, why should I go on longer in these foolish quests, keeping tryst with shadows that vanish at the touch? No nearer am I to a knight's estate than when, a stripling page, I listen to the minstrel's tales. The fountain softly splashed within the garden. From out the banquet hall there stole the sound of tinkling lutes, 
And then the lily maiden sang. Her siren voice filled all his heart, and he forgot his oath to duty. But presently, a star reflected in the fountain made him look up into the jeweled sky, where shone the polar constellation. And there he read the oath he had forgotten. With the compass needle of my soul, true to the north star of my great ambition, I will follow where it leads." Thrusting his fingers in his ears to silence the beloved voice of her who sang, he madly rushed from out the garden into the blackness of the night. The castle of content clanged its great gate behind him. He shivered as he felt the jar through all his frame, but never taking out his fingers, on he ran till scores of furlongs lay between him and the tempting of that siren voice. It was a strange and fearsome wood that lay between him and the cave. All things seemed moaning and afraid. He saw no forms, but everywhere the shadows shuddered, and moans and groans pursued him, till nameless fears clutched at his heart with an icy chill. Then, suddenly, the earth slipped away beneath his feet, and cold waves closed above his head. He knew now that he had fallen in the pool that lies upon the far edge of the fearsome wood, a pool so deep and of such whirling motion that only by the fiercest struggle may one escape. Gladly he would have allowed the waters to close over him. Such cold pain smote his heart. Had he not seemed to hear the old minstrel's song, it aroused him to a final effort, and he gasped between his teeth. "'Tis the king's call, O list! Thou heart and hand of mine, keep tryst! Keep tryst, or die!" With that, in one mighty struggle, he dragged himself to land. A bowshot farther on, he saw the cave and by sheer force of will crept toward it. What happened then he knew not till the moon rose full and high above him. A form, swathed all in black, bowed over him. Edorin, she sighed, here is thy token that the king may know that thou hast met me face to face. He thought it was a diamond at first that sparkled there beside the star. But when he looked again, lo, nothing but a tear. Then went he back into the joyous garden by slow degrees, for now he was sore spent, and after that the summons came full often. Whenever all the world seemed loveliest and life most sweet, then was the call most sure to come. But never once he faltered, never was he faithless to the king's behest, up weary mountain steps he toiled to find the somber face of disappointment there in waiting, and suffering and pain were often at his journey's end, and once a sore defeat. But bravely, as the months went by, he learned to smile into their eyes, no matter which one handed out to him the pledge of duty well performed. One day, when he no longer was a beardless youth, but grown to pleasing stature and of great brawn, he heard the hoped-for call of which he had long dreamed. Edirin, Edirin, the king himself awaits thee. Midsummer morn at lark song, keep tryst beside the palace gate. As travelers on the desert, spent and worn, see far across the sand to the palm's tree green that marks life-giving wells, so Edirin hailed this summons to the king. The soul-consuming thirst that long had urged him on grew fiercer as the well of consummation came in sight. Hope shod his feet with wings, and thus with every nerve strain he pushed toward the final tryst. 
So fearful was he, some mishap might snatch the cup away ere it had touched his thirsty lips, that three full days before the time he reached the Vale of Avalon, and sat him down outside the entrance to the palace. Now there came prowling through the wood that edged the fair domain the gnarled dwarfs that do the will of Shudderwain. And Shudderwain, of all the giants thereabouts, most cruel was and to be feared. Knowing full well what pleasure it would give the bloody monster, these dwarfs laid evil hands on Edorin. Sleeping they found him, and bound him with hard leathern thongs, and then with jibes and impish laughter dragged him into a dungeon past the help of man. Two days and nights he lay there, raging at fate and at his helplessness, till he was well nigh mad, bethinking him of all his baffled hopes. And like a madman gnawed he on the leathern thongs till he was free, and beat his hands against the stubborn rock that would not yield, and threw himself against the walls that held him in. The dwarves from time to time peered through the slattered window overhead, and mocked him, pointing with their crooked thumbs. Ha ha, thou keep no tryst, they chattered, but thou'll swear upon thy oath to go back to the joyous garden, and hark no more for Merlin's call, we'll let thee loose from out this dungeon of thy disappointment. Then was Edirin tempted, for the dungeon was foul indeed, and his heart cried out to go back to the lily maiden. But once more in his ears he thrust his fingers and cried, To the king's call alone I'll list, O heart and hand of mine keep tryst, Keep tryst or die. On the third night, with the quiet of despair, he threw him prone upon the dungeon floor and held his peace, no longer gnawing at his thongs or beating on the rock. A single moonbeam struggled through the slatted window, and by its light he saw a spider spinning out a web. Then, looking dully around, he saw the dungeon was hung thick with other webs, foul with the dust of years. Great festoons of the cobweb film shrouded his prison walls. As up and down the hairy creature swung itself upon its thread, the hopeless eyes of Edirin followed it. All in a twinkling, he saw how he might profit by the spider's teaching, and clapped his hands across his mouth to keep from shouting out his joy so that the dwarves could hear. Now once more, like a madman rushing at the walls, he tore down all the dusty webs and twisted them together in long strands. These strands he braided in thick ropes and tied them, knotting them and twisting and doubling once again. All the while he kept bewailing the stupid way in which he wasted time. Three days ago I might have quit this den, he sighed, had but I used the means that lay at hand. Full well I know that heaven always finds a way to help the man who helps himself. No creature lives too mean to be of service, and even dungeon walls must harbor help for him who boldly grasps the first thing that he sees and makes it serve him. So fast and furiously he worked that, long before the moonbeam faded, his cobweb rope was strong enough to bear his weight, and long enough to reach twice over to the slatted window overhead. By many trials he at last succeeded in throwing it around a spike that barred the window, and climbing up, he forced the slats apart and clambered through. Then, tying the rope's end to the window, he slid down all the dizzy cliffside in which the dwarves had dug their dungeon, and dropped into the stream that ran below. Lo, when he looked around him it was dawn, midsummer morn it was, and, plunging through the wood, he heard the lark's song rise, and reached the palace gate, just as it opened to the blare of trumpets for the king's train to ride forth.
When Edrin saw the royal cavalcade, he shrunk back into the wayside bushes, so ill-befitting did it seem that he should come before the king in tattered garments, with blood upon his hands where the sharp rocks had cut, and with foul dungeon stains. But that the king might know he had ever proven faithful, he sank upon his knees and bared his breast at his approach. There all the pledges glistened in the sunlight in rainbow hues. There pain had dropped her heart's blood in a glittering ruby, and honor had set her seal upon him in a golden star. A diamond gleamed where sorrow's tear had fallen, and amethysts glowed now with purple splendor to mark his patient meeting with defeat. But mostly were the pledges little pearls for little duties faithfully performed, and there they shone, and as the people gazed, they saw the jewels take the shape of letters, so that the king read out before them all, Semper Fidelis. Then the king drew his royal sword and lightly smote on Edrin's shoulder, and cried, Arise, Sir Knight, Sir Edrin the Trusty. Since I may trust thee to the utmost in little things as well as great, since thou of all men art most worthy, henceforth by thy king's heart thou shalt ride, ever to be his faithful guard and comrade. So there before them all he did them honor, and ordered that a prancing steed be brought and a good sword buckled on his side. Thus Edirin won his sovereign's favor. Soon, by his sovereign's grace permitted, he went back to the joyous garden to woo the lily maiden. And when he had won his bride and borne her to the palace, then was his great reward complete for all his years of fealty to his vow. Then out into the world he went to guard his king. Henceforth blazoned on his shield and helmet, he bore the crest, a heart with a hand that grasped a spear, and underneath these words, I keep the tryst. <laughs>